deletions, additions, corrections to the minutes? No approval is issued. Second. Okay, thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, thank you. Um, incremental regional transit improvements. Sounds very cool. Doesn't it? Okay, let's go. <laughs> This actually is really cool because we get to show you the things that we think about that you that you don't hear about. Um, we've been thinking about incremental expansion for the regional system for a long time, and right now it's a very hot topic in the newspaper. And there's it's a natural thing for us to um, have some advancement when we've been working on something, and then and then it becomes um, viable from a public perspective. So. I'm going to talk a little bit about what we do today, which is actually not that great. Um, we have two routes that cross county lines. One is the 300X, and that goes from our Almerton Road park and ride at 8780 Almerton Road to downtown Tampa. This is primarily a commuter route operating a few trips in the morning, a few trips in the evening, a couple in the middle, but really it's, it's an hour to two hours in between service, especially in the middle of the day. Our 100X goes from Gateway Mall to downtown Tampa through Britain Plaza across uh, the Gandhi Boulevard. And there's a lot of discussion about how we could expand this right now. Our proposal for our June service change is to make two changes to these routes. First is to connect into Tampa International Airport using our 300X. Um, it, before June, if you wanted to go from Pinellas County to the airport using this route, you'd have to go into downtown Tampa and then come back out on a heart route in order to get to the International Airport. With the opening of the consolidated rental car facility, the new routes that Hart is putting into the airport, we thought this is a great opportunity for us to take advantage of the in investment in infrastructure that the DOT and the airport have made in order to make our trip more efficient and serve the airport using that 300X. The other change that we're proposing for June is the extension of the 100X. Uh, that This would take it from Gateway Mall into downtown St. Petersburg. And that's really, that is the action item uh, in front of you today which is to accept the funds from the Department of Transportation that would pay for this service. The type of funds that they are will, will pay for this extension at 100%. Cool. <laughs> They're getting Pretty cool. really, really Pretty cool, right? uh, nice to us. <clears throat> um, so th this is a picture of the Regional Transit Feasibility Plan top ranked corridors. And you'll see that we have um, a number of, of our plans that match up with this um, because this is not new. The results that are coming out of this, the key corridors, are continue to be those that regional spine um, that we've been looking at for a number of years. Mr. Chair? Yes, I'm can sorry. I, can I ask a question? Or, sure. or should you? Yeah, I, I don't want to wait in No. I, um, what, what, is the, what is the ridership of? In you, I think we've <coughs> talked about that before, and I was just curious. I, I understand that the action item is for <coughs> money that's already been made available to, to strengthen this. And so I was just curious about the ridership of, of the 100X and the 300X and what that's changed. And what do, you, what do you figure it might extend to when we expand it from and, and go down the same feet on the, uh, what in, on, the, uh, on the 100? And then I'm also curious at the end, uh, how does this kind of fit in with, with what's being discussed right now from the uh, TMA? Uh, oh, I'm so going to get to that. Yeah, okay. Mm. So that's at the end, that's a, yes. a, a curiosity. 80,000 is the annual ridership trips on the two, the Gandhi and the um, Tower Franklin combined. And that's really... With its limited service right now. Yes. It, yeah. Yes. And what, uh, it's what's mainly, the, mainly rush hour service. Mm -hmm. Peak hour service mainly. Mm -hmm. uh, the Gandhi service is better. It's twice as good as the uh, 300 across Almerton and the Hard Franklin. It's about 
every hour in the rush hour or peak periods on our Franklin. And now this airport will only will be about every hour. And then it's about every half hour, so it's better to go from Gateway Mall to uh, Tampa. But the ridership is actually pretty even. Uh, Hillsborough people coming to Pinellas and Pinellas people going to Hillsborough. Um, both ways. And but that's only bus. Monday through Friday. There is no weekend service. And there's right. no weekend service. Right. Yeah. And you and you uh, you guys made a presentation I know to, to Dunedin and and I know you're talking about really promoting this and, and I appreciate that very, very much because I find it hard myself to talk about it to someone and I don't well, Bill Johnson can do that. It comes right off the tip of his tongue, and he just goes right out and tell you what's happening. And so, when we do this, I'm, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make sure that I really understand it and I really, really can communicate it. Because when I start talking about it, people say, "What well, does it run all the time?" Or when, when doesn't it run? Or can I take it to the airport? Well, you, you can indirectly take it to the airport, but you can't. Now you can, but when can you take it, et cetera, et cetera. And I appreciate you covered that in here. You're talking about the promotion of this. And so I think that's really going to be really important. But thank you for the information so far about the ridership, current riderships. The extension down to St. Pete, what do we suppose will happen with that? Do we have any, any must have been some estimation made of what we thought the ridership would be? We did not do any travel demand forecasting on that. Um, yet, and we, we could if you wanted to, but um, no. we think this corridor, the connection between downtown and Gateway and then over to Tampa, is a critical one um, that has been studied on a regional level for a long time. And it's part of that, that regional spine that T. Barta has been talking about it for, for a decade, that um, previous regional plans have looked into. And so we know that this is something that we need to get started. The service and extending the existing trips to downtown is still not what it should be. I mean, even just in what you what you just said, it's we really need to have a consistent service all day long in order to make this a viable regional connection for people on a regular basis. If I may, mm -hmm. um, on that slide. Um, so just to understand, so the, the, the dotted line is the, is the extension that's being proposed, and that is um, an express service versus yes. being downtown and taking like the number nine or four bus up to Gateway Mall. Yes. Yeah. But that new service still doesn't connect downtown to the airport. Not right. yet. Mm -hmm. Okay. Not yet. Or to, the, or to the other express line to the airport. Are you ready for this? Thing? I, I am. I am. We're on the you're ready. Time. I know. You're ready for the next piece. Okay. I have one more question. He knew what the next slide was. Yeah. I looked ahead. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you, if you what are they? Um, three stops in St. Pete. Four that are showing on there. Nine. Those are, are four. downtown. So frequently with an express service, you would have several stops in the core, a quick run to the next stop. Um, in this case, we're showing Gateway Mall, but we do have. Um, a planned stop at 22nd Avenue North. There's a park and ride there, and I'll, I'll get to that in the Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. okay. Small one. We don't mean to interrupt your. I do. No, it just shows your excitement. <laughs> your you know what? It, all it means to me is that you're actually listening. Yeah. What? When you interrupt me, <laughs> yeah. Thank Sorry, you. Sorry. Go ahead. Thank you. <laughs> so we do have a couple of options for our long-term vision, and you may remember some of these lines from our community bus plan that we finished in 2013. We'll be updating that plan, so again, taking another fresh look at these, making some adjustments. Um, but he here are the regional connections that we have in plans or in our program um, in order to move forward. You see, um, starting in the south, we have our Central Avenue BRT project. This is the catalyst project for the region, showing the region how we can do a limited stop service that is very successful, as Brad mentioned at the previous meeting, creating dedicated lanes to bypass uh, some of the congestion. We would do the same on 275 and working on um, a shoulder um, running bus options with the Florida Department of Transportation. Um, if we kept our took our current 100x and left it on 275 but when the express lanes open we could move that to the howard franklin bridge and take advantage of the speeds on the express lanes this would also connect into the planned gateway intermodal center again this is 
this is a, these are a few years out. A lot of these projects at Gateway Intermodal Center has not yet been programmed by the department, um, but this is our opportunity to talk about how we need it and how we would use it. We would also have um, our 300X go into that Gateway Intermodal Center, um, as well as a North County Express, um, and that could either be on 19 or on McMullen Booth. We could, we could talk about what that looks like in the future, but this also includes our Beach Express. Um, again, connecting into into the airport. So in this case, you would have uh, three routes connecting into our, the Gateway Intermodal Center. And again, this is just the regional system. This is not the local system that's operating underneath it. And then four routes that go to the airport. Another option would be to go ahead and leave service on the Gandhi um, and maybe move that to fourth as a limited stop service. Again, changing the dynamic of, of what we're providing out there, understanding that the connection from downtown to downtown um, would, would need to be, if it's going to the airport, a 5 a.m. to midnight, 30-minute service. It's a very robust service and so, so that employees of the airport could, could take it as well as travelers. What, what did you feel the, the, the uh, advantage, or what do you recommend? Well, there was two options, option A and B, and I looked at them. In my humble, with my humble background, I wasn't able to really, if somebody say, well, this is, now you're gonna have a test and now put down your preference, and I wasn't really sure which one would, would be better. Oh, option A or option B? Yeah, is there a um, choice? I think that comes in the future as we start to move forward with a public process. Okay. Remember these are, so we're putting our, putting a, an idea out there, and when it comes time to changing the service, you know, there are people, we want this service to be used, right? And when, and when you build up a service on the Gandhi Bridge and then you move it to the Howard Franklin, that changes people's trip and it would change the ridership profile as well. And so there needs to be a public discussion about do we leave service on the Gandhi um, and, or, and add it to Howard Franklin Bridge as the express lanes open, or do we move that service? So there's no estimated advantage on, by staff on, on either well, one of these? you know, the Howard Franklin Bridge is going to have express lanes. Yes, yes. Right. And the Gandhi does not. Does not. So there, that's a benefit to moving it to the Howard Franklin. Yeah. However, there are all the existing riders and a demand for direct to downtown Tampa. You know, workers who just, we're going to get folks, I predict, to come to the PSA meeting and go to the podium and be upset with going, making the little trek up to the, the airport that are workers in downtown Tampa because they don't want to be delayed. Yeah. I mean, they're not going to the airport. They're going to downtown Tampa. So the other is just much more direct to downtown and or to, so to the downtown. There will be some time savings by going in the express lanes, and maybe that will eat up, that will be about... That'll make up for the um, swing into the airport, you know, which is a lot faster theoretically now because they built. You don't have to go all the way into the terminal now. You can go to the Sky Connect. Um, so we'll just have to see. Like, well, and um, the and there's other investments planned. Something that's not on here is the West Shore Intermodal Center, which would be on the north side of 275. If, if the people mover was extended down to, to that, we would connect into that and that would make our trip more efficient. Again, that's not our investment, that's the Department of Transportation's investment, but it, it, it affects our ability to create a service that makes sense for people. And I think this next video really shows that, how we're working with the department to encourage them to make investments in infrastructure so that we can provide a better service. initiated a study to develop statewide guidance and criteria for bus on shoulder operations in Florida. The bus on shoulder concept has been utilized by several transit agencies around the country. It is a cost-effective measure to improve transit travel time reliability and increase ridership. When speeds drop below 35 miles per hour in the general purpose lanes, the bus may merge onto a 11 foot to 12 foot wide shoulder by passing traffic. The Atlas Sun Coast Transit Authority, or PSTA, is collaborating with FDOT on a pilot project along the five mile segment of Interstate 275 in Pinellas County. Pinellas County is one of the most densely populated counties in the state with two major cities, St. Petersburg and Clearwater. These cities are major centers for jobs and commerce and have experienced consistent growth over the years. With growth, there comes a need for an efficient transportation system and alternative modes of transportation. The proposed bus on shoulder project is consistent with the Regional Transit Feasibility Plan. Currently, the I-275 corridor is operating at a level of service.
drivers have adequate space to operate comfortably and safely. A profile fuel-plastic parking strip will be added to the outside edge of travel along the corridor as a safety guide for vehicles. The bus on shoulder corridor will have signs showing drivers the beginning and end of the bus on shoulder segment. Signs throughout the corridor will alert drivers to watch for buses on shoulder and warn drivers that all authorized buses are allowed on the shoulder. PSTA will provide advanced training for the bus drivers operating on the shoulder. The bus on shoulder route is an extension of Route 100X to downtown St. Petersburg. While the current 100X service operates as a commuter route during peak hours, PSTA's vision is to eventually operate this route every 30 minutes from downtown St. Petersburg to downtown Tampa during the hours of 5 a.m. and 12 a.m. Monday through Friday. In a northbound direction, the bus on shoulder route will begin at the I-275, I-375 interchange. Using the Fifth Avenue ramp, the bus will merge on to I-275 north. If the bus on the shoulder conditions have been met, the bus will proceed on the shoulder. At interchanges along the corridor, the bus will yield to oncoming traffic, which will impact the traffic if necessary. on this for about a year and a half with the department um, independently but it, of the regional transit feasibility plan um, but clearly those things have to <coughs> come into concert together we we talked to them about um, doing a low-cost solution to start um, and the department has since this project started and the regional transit feasibility project has started they're starting to they're looking at express lanes in this section as well. So they're just about to start a study that would look at express lanes. This could be a very low cost interim solution to our issues of getting um, high frequency, high efficiency travel on this on this corridor in the meantime. Um, so we do still need to encourage the department to pursue these kinds of operational improvements uh, that would help us. Um, I, I have a question. Before I, make, and before I ask the question, just so there's uh, clarification from my position on this, I'm extremely supportive of, uh, of, of the system and, and have, have heard <coughs> everywhere from Jacobs Engineering to Department of Transportation about because it's really using what's an infrastructure that's in place until I hear something other that would cause me to have a problem with it, but otherwise I, it's just fantastic. Um, do we have any idea of or do you have any studies, or have you looked at how many times the bus, according to that requirement of having the 35 miles an hour, would have to move over into into those lanes? I'm I'm a supporter of the bus being in those lanes at almost at all times, but but I understand how the traffic changes. I, I'm familiar with it. I've seen it myself personally. Um, more than more, many times, shall we say, where you know it's really crowded now, and then boom, it's now it's four o'clock. Now it's really, really crowded, and now it's 6 o'clock, it's still really, really crowded, now it's 7 o'clock, and now it's not so crowded. Um, 
And so in my mind's eye, I'm wondering who's going to be making that decision of that maneuver back and forth. And I'm also curious, and I never did ask the DOT this, is there a possibility of a communication for a vehicle that becomes a sub-vehicle that has to get into that shoulder for a breakdown purpose, that it could actually move over and past the shoulder into, into the other right away? Yes, yeah, so, the, so uh, it could be signs that break, vehicles broken down need to move on, onto the grass, because that doesn't happen that often. Um, the, the frequency at which we would move over would be determined by the operator, uh, him or herself, um, operating at a speed, if the tra general traffic is at 35 miles or less, then he or she can move over, but understand that they can only go 15 miles over the traffic. So you don't want somebody stopped and somebody else going 35 miles an hour. You know, it'll be a difference of if the traffic is going 20, the operator will be able to go at 35 in the shoulder. Now, if it's a separated um, by another, a separated lane like an express lane, you could go much faster. So the express lanes are still better for travel <coughs> speeds. This just helps us be as consistent as we possibly can. So if there is if there is an accident and it's five miles up the road, we'll be able to get get to that point much faster. We'll still have to go around whatever's happening. Or you know, how many times have you slowed down and there was an accident, but it happened three hours ago, right? And it's still everybody's still slowing down. So we would be able to just bypass that congestion. So from point. the planning purposes, I understand that some of the tests were done by, by cities that were up north and understanding how their how their conditions, driving conditions are a little bit different. And understanding why we're staying at thirty five because we don't want the bus running down there at eighty miles an hour, we we don't think. Uh, but certainly in some of the in some of the some of the northern conditions where they made that limitation, I wasn't sure whether that was based on the conditions of of the road or what they estimated it could be at a given point in time due to you know significant uh, temperature changes and the like. I just I was real curious to get that cleared up in my own mind. I I, I didn't before I ever get that cleared up. So I don't know if I've ever talked about temperature and this. Okay. But so in other words, option. the speed, the purpose of the speed it's was really that just speed, was that yeah. you you wanted them to switch at that point in time, but there's no limitation of how fast the bus can go on that shoulder. There is. Yes, 15 miles over what the general traffic is doing. But exactly. that would have to be an assessment done by exactly. The so that driver. limitation was based on some something, and it was and 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 I never asked the question of what okay. that was. Was that the condition of the shoulder that did that, or was that another limitation? No, I, well, so I think traffic uh, safety. all of the safety manuals and engineering studies have shown. You know, it's unsafe to have a high speed lane next to a stop lane, right? If you've been driving and something bothers by you, it feels unsafe, you know. Um, I mean, you could think of it the same way as, you know, if, if, if you've ever had to pull over your car and get out for a reason and the traffic is whizzing by at 60 miles an hour, you, you, you want to pull over really far so you have some space. It, it really does. I, I was create, wondering if there's yeah. just an engineering reason as to why, they, why that limitation was put on that 15 plus 35. It's a okay. traffic engineer. Call it, yeah. call it. And so I was wondering if there was another limitation that was discovered. Apparently not. Maybe. No. No. Anyway. So. Thank no. You. Now we Good. do want to have. Good. We do want to take. It's a soft shoulder right now, so it would we would need it to be a hardened shoulder. We've asked the department to uh, make that hardened shoulder um, 11 and a half feet at a minimum, so that we have enough room to operate the buses. A 10 foot lane would not be adequate for us um, and we've also asked them as part of this they would have to move move the rumble strip so either make it so it fits between the wheelbase or put that thermoplastic uh, line you know and create the, a different kind of, of rumble strip on the side and both of those will be accomplished before this kicks in yes Thank you. now the ramp metering um, is probably the most expensive part mm -hmm. of the program we have asked for that what that would allow is if a bus was running on the shoulder it would stop the oncoming traffic uh, from the ramp so that the bus could pass through and then and then the traffic would be allowed to come into the on-ramp thank you um so i appreciate the explanation about the speed that was one of the questions that i had in, in my
mind. Um, and I imagine it would be accomplished mostly in training, but how, how do we have drivers understand the current rate of speed? Is there, is there any mechanism or data available to them other than just gauging um, how fast you know, cars are going? And then coupled with that, you know, um, what agency is going to be responsible for enforcing that speed? And how's their training going to be, uh, you know, interlaced into that matrix so that they're not... Well, there would be additional that. road rangers on this section if we want to do this as a pilot section for the state. The DOT is committed to having additional road rangers on there in order to help motorists with, with any issues and clear accidents. Um, the drivers would have to be trained. There's a number of cities that do this around the country. I know um, Minnesota is, has probably the most miles of anyone of, of bus on shoulder operations, and, and training the operator is the key. And I love that we're not the first, um, that we can learn from what other uh, communities have done. I just, um, I didn't know if we were going to be using road sensors or if there's, you know, there's, you know uh, data available from other cars that are driving, what their average speeds are, and then that's transmitted to the bus driver. I don't think they do that now, but in the future, if you wanted to put this with connected vehicles, the connected vehicle technology, which is part of the autonomous vehicle technology, I think that would be a viable communication between vehicles. I think we do actually have the capability right now to uh, sit in the dispatch room, the radio room, and you can see the speed of every bus right now. So right, we, but you, you can't see could, the speed of the road, right? You right. Can, so, so. Yeah. Well, you, you can get that through ways or some of the driver assistance. Which is what I was asking if we're winding up, if we're going to incorporate some of that technology to assist drivers instead of just using their own perception of speed, but having something that is documented so that we're not, you know, if, this, if we're off on the schedule a little bit, so we're trying to make up some time, so maybe we're pushing that 20 miles an hour and now we're a little bit unsafe, but who's to judge because there's no real data, you know, it starts to get a little, a little iffy as we'll, to what we'll, may happen. We'll get there. As you said, well, I, I think <laughs> that is something that we could put into our request to the MPO <coughs> and to uh, the Department of Transportation as we ask for uh, money for new vehicles for this service. Mm. And we could certainly think about how we could make those new vehicles be connected vehicles. Because I think it's fantastic. I mean, the traffic's at mm -hmm. 15 and you're going 30, then you're getting there twice as fast as everybody else. And right. it, that's yeah. a pretty easily marketable message. Yeah. Uh, I have a question, and that is, with regard to the vehicles themselves. Um, if we're gonna be driving at highway speeds um, on a consistent basis, uh, um, do we need a different type of vehicle, a different type of bus than our uh, route buses? And would that increase, therefore, our need for uh, maybe a fleet size increase or a modification to the uh, percentage allocation of types of fleet vehicles? I remember, let me give you an example. I remember uh, when, I, when I was in college, I was an oarsman, and uh, our boathouse was in East uh, Hartford, and the college was in West Hartford. So we hired the local bus company that Jim used to work for to um, take us over there. And on a couple of occasions, instead of having the bus with the uh, highway gearing and all that, we had a regular city bus, and the guy had it on the floor, and we were everybody was passing us uh, very very quickly as we were driving along the highway to get over to the boathouse. So, what I'm asking really is, um, do our uh, existing fleet of of um, conventional buses uh, work? Will they work well? in a highway scenario, or do we have to go more to the type of highway vehicles that we use now on the 100X? And, uh, yeah. Right now we are using our regular, bus. all of our regular PSA buses can go on the highway, no well, problem. Who's, I've, I've, the trolleys, no, LA I'm trolley talking about the, uh, Don't we have buses that are more highway buses and more like? We used to. We got rid of them? We got rid of them. Okay, fine. All right, as long as they can do it, that's fine. I'm just asking a question. Yeah. With regard to trying to cut down the number of variables of inventorying parts and, uh, you know, training our mechanics to handle it and all those kind of things if we have a wider array of buses. Plus, as a daily user of this um, 
service in the frequency. The greatest part of this uh, F, F dot little video that I thought was, this is the first time I've seen in my life that they actually admitted that I-275 in Pinellas County is operating at a level server F. <laughs> because they've always said, oh, it's fine. Yeah, that's what that stands for. <laughs> but it's, these buses are not going to be going uh, high speed. The, okay. the traffic is like at zero or 20, so they're yeah. going to be going 35 miles an hour. Yeah, no, that's fine. But I'm talking about if they're going in the highway uh, on normal speeds, you know, at normal times of the day, you know, when it's not congested, if that ever exists. When the drivers get done with their day at late at night or whatever, and um, they're making a beeline back to PSDA, I see them on the highway going just fine. Okay. Um, All right, good. That answers my question. So the, the primary action today is to approve the acceptance of uh, the urban corridor funding so that we can extend the trips on the 100 X. Um, I think the secondary action that could be taken today is discussing how you would like to approach a continued conversation with the Department of Transportation about putting the infrastructure in place so that we could run more efficiently. Okay. Well, I'm all for uh, doing everything we can to accelerate the process and move it along as quickly as possible. I would, I would be willing to make a motion, if you wish, Chair. Yes, please. I would make a motion. Before I make that motion, just a quick question. Is there anything that we're missing here? Are there any negative that we haven't seen here? Uh, I can't think of any, so I just wanted to ask that question of staff. The primary action, there's there's really no downside at all, right? Um, right. The secondary action, I think, would still have some details to work out with the department in terms of uh, how they fund it and and when it comes online. But I don't see anything that jumps out of me like as, a, as an board, issue. A letter of support, a letter Just, of uh, yeah. letter to FTOT. Yeah. I, 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 we need two motions. I'm willing to make two motions. The first motion would be that we accept we accept the. Uh, the offering here to go forward as quickly as possible. Do I hear a second? Second. second. <laughs> okay, everybody agrees with that. All in sure. favor? Aye. 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 Okay, that's good. And I'm willing to make a second motion, and that is that that we uh, um, suggest to the to the board that we we communicate with FDOT um, some of these other issues and, and ask for their support on them as, as quickly as possible, so that not necessarily that it withholds the other part of it, but but that it be moved forward as quickly as possible for consideration and, and implementation if necessary. Okay, all right. Go ahead. Second that. All right, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, passes unanimously, thank you. Can, Mr. Can, Mr. Torga, I uh, appreciate your motions on that, thank you. And can I make uh, just one more statement, Chair? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I agree that there's really, there's little um, negative to this. The only, the only negative I see is one of perception of the public um, especially as we, we explain that we're extending the route and the same reaction I had, which is why doesn't St. Pete go to the airport, right? We just read the article in the paper that we have connections to the airport. So um, I would recommend when, when presenting that just the, saying that there are other plans coming. Let's not wait for the next slide, right? Let, let's, you know, this is first step in a multi-step process to hopefully get you to the airport. It's first going to connect the gateway. Uh, would, would be a way to just <coughs> Any notion? Okay. That's how my draft was, and then it got confusing when I practiced. But okay. I'll try it that way. Okay. Yeah. This how is exciting stuff. This is good. Yeah. 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 Well, you you can't really go to the airport until you get the express lanes and the bridge. I understand. Or otherwise, you're going to be stuck there, and you don't want the folks from St. Pete to downtown Tampa. Is, is that right? Is yes, the candy is, is a much a much faster bridge trip on a consistent basis. I agree. You know they're going to extend the um, express lanes, the Selman, I, uh, faster, <coughs> and they'll build the lanes on the bridge. I think. Yeah, I can check to see when the when the Selman lanes are supposed to be operational. The Howard Franklin project is supposed to be finished in 2023, but they would move the traffic from one bridge to the other while they finished with the old bridge in probably 2022. But still a ways away, um, unless we can figure out how to maybe do some restriping, make those shoulders a little I'm wider sure on the bridge. Letter of support will. I'm sure letter of support will like <laughs> really Cut the good. time in half. Right. Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. Good. 
All right. I'm Bonnie today. Yeah, I just have to. Should we play the role of Bonnie in the production on the Direct Connect? Mm -hmm. Bonnie, All right. All right. Moving along. Okay. So Bonnie is not here today because <coughs> she is at the Shared Use Mobility Conference in Chicago, which is exactly what we've been talking about here today. Um, PSTA has gotten a lot of recognition nationally for our Direct Connect program and our partnerships with Uber. And as you recall, I think this is the wrong presentation. I'm not the one you sent me last night. Nope. This morning. That's okay. Um, we did get a lot of attention for our first our first phase um, of our service, which looked at just Pinellas Park, seeing how we could partner with Uber um, and United Taxi and Care Ride in order to get people to the bus faster. We expanded that program in a second phase to include the entire county, um, eight zones where people could take a ride to one of eight designated stops and get on the bus. Um, people had some comments about this. We did get some more people to use it and they were excited about it. Um, they did find it difficult to um, get to the zone if they were trying to go north and the stop was south and they were just on the edge of the zone trying to get to what is not just the nearest stop but the stop that's closest to where they're trying to get to and the, and the route that they're trying to use. This is just an example. Um, in this year, we want to expand the service to be 24 locations focused on our core routes. So we've selected 24 stops across the county um, where people could get to our highest frequency routes or, and or the routes that we plan for the highest frequency. Um, and instead of using a little slider on their phone, we're changing to the Uber uh, promo code, Uber to PSTA, again, making that connection that this is getting to the bus. We also have um, a robust outreach and marketing plan that goes along with this, and this video is not here. I, I did not get an updated one, I'm sorry. I thought maybe I missed it, but I didn't. Yay. Is there one that was on here from Zoom? Just to check one. Mr. Chairman, when you, when you have a yep. second, I have a yeah. question. Okay. Go for All it. Right. So, so that was the one that um, I live in the countryside, an email and I could take <coughs> a direct connect to any of the spots rather than just the designated yeah. spot in my district. Starting April 2nd, yes. So, for instance, I could take it to um, like if you're going the north spot or south. In East Bay and 19th. But I would be, because this only pays for the first $5, I would pay for the $20 to go that much farther. Yeah. So the, the discount just gives you the five, five bucks off the, the initial five bucks. Yes. So the add on to, if I may, and I, I'll let you continue, but you, he could come to Dunedin, to the Dunedin one, correct? From where he just sat. Yes. And what would something like that cost for them to do that? Do you estimate? Well, the minimum Uber trip right now is six seventy. So it's it could be close to six. It could be close to six seventy for him to come to Dunedin, for example. No, but he could five dollars off if he took it to the bus Dunedin bus stop. Correct. Mm -hmm. So he gets five dollars off. So he pays. I'm sorry, Phil. I didn't mean to take. It could be it could be a ten dollar ride, and he gets five dollars off if he wants to go the extra mileage to. Dunedin because he's going north and he wants to hop on the so on the jolly trolley and go up to what, whatever the Uber charge is, yeah. whatever that is, which yeah. changes. Yeah. Right. And, and it and you can only take it to a designated PSTA transfer point. Right, one of the twenty-four designated stops. So I couldn't take it to Caledesi Island and get a five-buck discount because Calabasas Island doesn't have 
is not a. Well, you also take metro. Don't you have to spot. take a ferry to Caledonia? What? <laughs> no. Okay. So, oh yes, you. Okay. Yes. <laughs> okay. Well, when we first started this whole process, uh, the finance committee had a good deal of conversation about how do we avoid scamming, basically, the system. If we open this up to not just the closest stop, but to many stops, Uber will wake out well, but will we necessarily receive increased ridership as a result of this? I mean, uh, people might just go to a stop, a designated stop, and that's near where they want to go. Um, they might. We've tried to locate the 24 locations um, in ways that that probably won't happen too much, mm -hmm. but no doubt it maybe is happening some. We don't think it's happening a lot mm -hmm. now. The, the fears of massive scamming yeah. have been unrealized. Well, that was the unrealized. initial concern, as you recall, I mean, last year when we worked on this, we were concerned about that. It turned out it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. But if we open this up to a large number of additional stops, I can foresee a good deal of conversation along the lines of this this is uh, great for Uber, but maybe not so great for TSD. Well, there's, there's two things that we're doing that are trying to alleviate that worry. One is um, we have on our legislative agenda to ask uh, FTA to start counting Uber rides. So right now we do count. If there's a trip on Direct Connect that, is, that people, somebody takes on United Taxi, we're getting sufficient data that we're reporting that to the National Transit Database that is included in our ridership numbers and is therefore included in our formula dollars that comes back to us um, as, as part of our reporting. The Uber trips, um, we need more, a little more data um, and to um, discuss with the FTA how we would report those trips as well. The other thing that we're, that we're doing is in the context of our partnership with Transit App is trying to fold in more modes um, into that um, information portal but also the next step of that integrated app would be to buy a consolidated fare uh, through the app. So it would combine our transit app with our Flamingo, and then you could buy your bus fare and your ferry trip together. You could buy your bus trip and your Uber trip together so that it, it, it requires you to do both in order to get the discount. So we're, I mean, we're thinking of tech, technology ways to make that all work together so that you get that combined trip. So my question when I interrupted uh, Council Member um, Johnson was that issue. And that issue was it would seem like unless you attach that when we start getting, when we start opening this up, I'm not saying it is, um, that it would be, but now um, he can come from where he is over to Dunedin, for example, and we'd be delighted to have him there, certainly. <laughs> um, and, and, and then he's where he needs to be, and he stops. If there's a combination where he would have to purchase an ongoing move or, or something additional, I don't know what is, how that works within the system today. Um, although you tested it earlier to see what would happen, Suddenly now we're, as pointed out, it's becoming, it's becoming a, a larger system now. And I'm just making sure that it's, it's us facilitating um, what it is that we wish to happen. And maybe that's what we're wishing to happen. I, I don't know. Um, to have Uber, because that's, well, that's that, a, that is an open question. Yeah, that's you know, a good if, question. That's a good comment. Um, so far, we have designed all these um, programs to promote uh, getting more people access to the bus. But if we really are becoming a mobility management, we're not so worried about, we're trying to promote mobility within Pinellas County. Correct. We're not there yet, but maybe it's okay to subsidize Mr. Johnson's trip to Dunedin Brewery um, <laughs> on Uber only for $5 and give him a $5 discount. I don't know. Um, or whatever. And he never rides a bus. So I think, I think you know, that's a very interesting dichotomy here. We're, what we are trying to do is, whoops, maybe it maybe it is both, or maybe it's some combination. You know, we, if we're not tying in that other requirement, of course, if you tie in that other requirement, if if we go into this multiple fares that you can purchase on 
uh, with PSTA for different modes, you could end up with, you know, this is not a scam, but you could end up with the person just purchasing another dollar on the other end to go somewhere yeah. with a dollar's worth, and you still got four dollars. Um, so everybody's kind of figuring this out, and maybe that's okay too. Um, well, there's there's also there's a movement in the industry um, to go toward this mobility as a service. So you where you would buy a package like you do your cable now. You know, you could have the mm -hmm. sports package or or the kids package and you know you pick and choose what you want um, and so there's this discussion of well can you choose I want a, I want a monthly bus pass plus I want 10 uber trips and what does that cost me in my bundle right and you have somebody else who says well I want 30 um, lift trips and I want um, a two three days because that's that's what I need on the bus and um, and on on demand services so there's you know, there's a lot of things moving very quickly. I think um, it's always um, rewarding and challenging to be at the front edge of these kinds of technologies. And we, and we by doing these programs, um, we are testing them for the country. I so after reading the presentation before coming here, I'm, I'm going through that little routine in my head and I'm saying to myself, well, this is, this is probably good if, if we're trying to increase the mobility here. Um, it also ties into us selling another, another usable package that might be very inexpensive to somebody that wishes to come. Let's just say four or five or six, maybe three times a week they're going to be using, um, using the, the direct connect side of it. Um, and so if they just had a, another one of the packages, whatever that package would be, it might be fairly inexpensive. Um, we know that they're using or at least they're paying for part of the system in order to get the other part of the system. So maybe all things can work together for those who try to work together. Can I show you my video? <laughs> yeah. I'm so proud of it, and I'm so sad yeah. that it didn't get to play. Oh, really? Specially named, I know we went back and forth, and sorry that Bonnie isn't here to give you the final answer, but they are, Uber has created special names for those based okay. on the um, intersection. Okay. But if you, um, based on your GPS location of you and your phone, uh, Uber, the Uber app will know that you took the Uber to that stop and give you the $5 discount. You, you don't have to say, app. you don't have to tell them what stop. I'm, I'm thinking I want to come to the board meeting next week. Well, next week isn't after April 2nd. Right, the April meeting. April meeting. <laughs> so I, the nearest connection point is actually north at Tampa Road and US 19. So I'm thinking when I say I want this Uber Direct Connect, I want to designate which side of US 19 I would want to get dropped off at. Yeah, it'll and, cover that. And that's, that's the... It's like, it's like a... I can't remember the number of feet. Circumference zone. 800. 800 feet. Okay. 
So I can be, I can say, I want to be dropped off on the southbound stop rather than the northbound stop. Yes. Okay. And anyone can use this. Anyone yes. can anyone. use this. Yeah. When I say stop, it's like a set of stops because you have an intersection. You're right. going to have several stops depending on which routes go through that intersection. You could have as many as eight stops, but it's the same, that one intersection is designated. 24 7. No. 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 During service hours. No, just the service during, hours. During when the buses are running. The service hours of the buses. So it's an yeah, I, I heard that, that we were excluding uh, yellow Jeep owners for the purpose. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> That's it, go ahead. They got me. Uh, Mr. Shulman. Uh, <laughs> and, and we may not be there yet, but a question on the functionality. Um, if, I'm, if I'm plotting my course to so say I'm leaving my home and I want to go someplace else, Am I just given the one option of Uber from here to there, or you know, from from my home to the to a closest stop, and then the PSTA bus, or am I given several route options with potential cost differences, you know, and time change? Like I'm envisioning a situation like when I book a flight, right. and, and I, I book the flight, and it says, well, you can go on this flight or this flight. It gets in at this time or that time. Here's the price difference. And so you're allowing the consumer to say, ah, oh, you know what, for $2 more, I, that, that saves me 18 minutes. You know, maybe going north when you want to go yeah. south and that route makes sense, and you're giving them the option. Um, I don't know if it's something like that. Uh, but for me, that would be helpful in helping to determine just how to go. And, I think and you want to, we, that is where we're going with our work with Transit App. Okay. Yeah. Is, right. so we're right not there now, yet, but you're exactly right. That's yeah. what we need. Yeah. Right. Because yes. right now, Uber is totally designed. You type in where you want to go. and well, You don't always know. Like I know, you know, I know I want to get somewhere, but if it's connecting to something to get me somewhere, well, I don't automatically know the best connections for me to get right. where I want to go. I'm, I'm, I'm entrusting data from another source to educate me in real time at that moment. And I mention it now, knowing it's not necessarily in the works, but also knowing that It'll if you want to get there, you want to build a the next foundation year. to get yeah. there versus. I think that maybe this go back. Oh, we should have talked about that five years ago. That's the sort of theme of today: is there are things that we need to do today in order to be prepared for that future tomorrow. And this is my first time <laughs> sitting on the planning committee, so yeah. I'm, I, I got to realize yeah. we're planning ahead, not this is right this second. Yeah, it's, is yeah. Be very so, it's a different we're planning. mindset. Yeah, it's yes. We're planning. Okay. Yeah, that, that app has got to be incredibly complicated. I assume it's mm -hmm. it's got to be user friendly too. You know, even though it's very very complicated. They claim it's in development. Yeah. I don't know what that means. Yeah. Yeah. Everything's been developed. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> hey, it's really exciting stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, Debbie. Yeah. Debbie has the most exciting take, thing. Take it away. Oh, you know, last night I felt like I was a child again when you're in school up north and you say, Hey, Mrs. Hey, Mrs. Hey, Mrs. Please, please let me have a snow day. All I did last night was please, please let the information for budget go first because how can I follow this? You know, we had two exciting presentations. But really, the budget is. This is going to be exciting? Oh, no, budgets to me are always exciting. But it, it actually does lay a great foundation for what we're building on in the future. And we take a look at the budget over the next six months, and we take it in little bits and pieces putting it together in June, coming back to you again after we revise things during the summertime, and then for votes in September. And we type, like to take a look at a multi-year budget. Uh, we base it on a strategic plan of the board. So we try to take into consideration whether it's the innovations, whether it's trying to look at things practically, all of these things that the board members have concerns about or visions about into the budget. And we do it on a multi-year basis, and we base it on where we are today, and then we build off of that. Michael and team and myself, we challenge each of the departments to say, what are you going to be doing differently? How is that reflected? Is the budget reflective of our mission, vision, and goals? One of the things that I like to do in providing a multi-year budget is that it gives us a look forward to say, where are we going to be in not just one year, three years, let's look out at least five years on this. And so we can see what the impact of the decisions we're making today will have in the future. It allows us then to plan. And we'll be talking a little bit about the ad valorem tax, and this gives us that opportunity to make adjustments in how we do business when we see implications happening. On the revenue side, we've got some 
key revenue producers for us are ad valorem taxes. We get approximately $42 million today in ad valorem taxes you know, from our municipalities. So we are serving their customers in all these different areas with two, quite a big tune of money. We get passenger fares and then we get operating assistance from federal, state, and local. When we take a look at the ad valorem tax, we yes, we're currently at our maximum, which has helped us to grow our revenues, to help grow service and do innovative items. One of the things, when we take a look at the county projections, for this year that we're looking at for 19, originally it was a 4.3% that they anticipated it would go up by. Now they've revised those assumptions to 6% and revised it going out. That has a very positive impact looking forward because we had predicted that if the uh, homestead exemption goes through, we're going to have about a $1.9 million negative impact on our budget in 2020. When we take a look at the growth factors and the value of our properties, net of that approximately, I'll round it up, $2 million impact, we're going to be probably seeing a positive $5.4 million to our budget. So while we take a look at that, we're planning for it. Thank you for the property values going up. It's going to mitigate eliminate and even go beyond that so we don't have that worry that's out there. So the 6% increase equates to $5.4 million? Not just that, but over the next like four years. When I compare to where we years. were in the budget last year, which projected out to 2022, and I look at the difference based on these, uh, what the county is projecting, it's increasing us about $5.4 million. So it's increasing over what we used the last yep. time we did a projection for the first for right. the next last, five years or four years? Last year we did it in five years, which ended in 2022. And we put in the budget last year in the five-year projection the impact of the homestead exemption so that we could see. So I have less worry today than I did yesterday about that. So do you have any mitigation? I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. And then I'll get it. Or stay real simply. The difference between the projected 1.1 million. Oh, what, oh, did I say 1.9? It's 1.1? 1.9 million. 1.9 million. Oh, okay. Yeah. I apologize, Dan, because I thought it was 1.9. It is 1.9 million. Okay, so 1.9. So is it is it almost equal then over that period of time? It's a, the value, property values going up and, are and more than offsetting. They wash it out. They it seems like it's good of 5.4 million. It's gone. It's going above and beyond with the property values going up. The net increase, including the homestead exemption impact of about 1.9 million, is about 5. Point, I'm estimating it about 5.4 million. Now, what has happened last year is they predicted for the year that we're in now, fiscal 18, um, we would have a 4.8 percent increase in property values. The year before, um, I think it was also 4.8 million for 17 percent, you know, 4.8 percent increase in property values. It ended up being 7.9 percent. So we'll be starting out on a little bit better base as well. So that homestead exemption will have an impact on us, but the property values that are increasing will mitigate that and give us extra money in our budget. So I feel happy, I feel good. Um, our city <clears throat> had a presentation by the tax uh, appraiser. Oh yeah, yeah. And uh, he has a software program that they've developed that they're actually franchising out to other counties. But um, it's it, the program uh, gives a good hypothetical on what the impact will be for each, each city and actually what the impact would be to uh, each homeowner. Right. And we need to systematically at PSTA level, at the city level, at the county level, et cetera, <coughs> do an education program to make people aware that many of them are not going to be affected by this thing. It's not going to help them a bit and hope that we can possibly not get to 60% requirement to have this thing passed because that would dramatically impact, even with what Debbie's talking about, 
we need that we need that exemption not to pass and uh, so it would be very beneficial to do everything we can to help the property appraisers uh, software package get out as an educational tool to show people that their house is not going to be benefited by this thing in many cases and uh, hopefully we can we can kill this thing off because it's going to impact adversely every city and NPSTA fire departments other entities that are uh, dependent on tax revenue to operate. I believe it's on their website. And it I is. Yes. It is, but, just, but we need to get, get, get that out. We need yeah. to get it out. So um, we're doing well with that. Passenger fare revenues. Um, as you know, we've been talking about how passenger fares have been, passenger rides have been declining. We're assuming right now 0%. We are looking at doing fare capping on a regional basis. Uh, with our new Flamingo fares, we are still working out those numbers and what kind of impact that will have because we think it'll have in the short term some negative impact on our revenues but provide a very seamless regional system and an easy way to present it out to the public that basically the more you're riding the more you're going to save based on a daily pass and a monthly. So you'll be hearing more about that going forward because I think we're at a point on the uh, Flamingo, on the Regional Fair Media Project. Brad and I have talked that we should probably be bringing it to you more to get that word out on what it'll look like. So maybe in May, Brad, we can put it on our agenda? Hopefully. Yeah. yeah. Um, operating assistance, we get money from both the federal, the state, and local. Well, yes, I'm sorry. I asked a question about the fare box. If, uh, sure. Debbie, if you said that we get about $42 million from the Advil or would you just, I've asked this question before, I know. Would you just remind me about what the fare box is? The, the, the uh, nine points of the $10 yeah. million. Dollars. Ten million dollars. Thank you. Yeah, I've never heard that before. And on operating assistance, we get money from federal, state, and uh, you know, some local assistance. One of the things that we, Brad, has been a champion of is to not use our federal funds to any great extent for operations. Because when you're investing in something that's gone tomorrow, whether it be through a paycheck, whether it be through, and that's basically what we use it for is for our oper operators and mechanics, it's better used to be invested into buses that'll last 15 years. So every transit agency in the country uses some of their money, the formula money they get towards operating assistance. We've basically kept it flat for a number of years now and plan to do so going forward. That way we keep our emphasis on investing in long-term assets. We get state operating funds. Our largest one is our block grant funds. We also get reimbursements for our TV program, as you well know. And we also get some um, money from our urban quarter money and service enhancement money for our routes as well as other reimbursements. And those have been growing at a fairly steady rate. On the expenditure side, the salaries are our largest piece of the pie, salaries and fringes. And on the salary side, we're locked in uh, through this year on the operators and mechanics, so we'll be negotiating that. For the, we just took the supervisors to the board, we're gonna be locked in going out to 2020. So at least we have a little piece of it in there. We've been keeping this fairly steady in here at three and a half percent. For the benefits, again, health insurance is our biggest driver. In talking um, with different people, they're anticipating as an industry-wide that we'll see health insurance go up on the average industry-wide about 7%. Here in Florida, because of the makeup of the demographics, it'll be more like 10%. So we're going to have to see, because we're doing extremely well, how that plays into this. For diesel fuel, we're seeing an increase in the cost of diesel fuel. It's going up about, I'm guessing right now, based on the futures market, about 8.5%. Interestingly enough, when you take a look at our financials, we are under budget in diesel fuel. Reason being is the excellent work that the maintenance department does. We've locked in a piece that keeps it low, but the other pieces, we're also seeing an increase in the miles per gallon in our fuel. That's because we're maintaining those buses. And our usage. Well. Yeah. And, our us and our usage is down. For DART, uh, 
that is under contract, so this is basically what is out there through 2021. Then we made the assumption in the other years it'd probably stay steady at about 4%. I think that's going to have to be revised. If you look at the ridership, it was up 14%. Mm. But that's just the percent of increase over the contract. So we'll take that into consideration. Um, what, was, what, was, what was the 14%? Well, no. oh, okay. well, this was the Finance Committee that showed the ridership. Yes. At least for the month of uh, February, DART 14.22% up. Ridership. Right. So that's not in Debbie's number. Right. And those, those percentages are what the costs are in the contract per ride. Go up by those percentages. They go up by 2.6% uh, plus if ridership keep going up. Plus the ridership. Plus the ridership. Debbie, I saw that 12.8% and I was just, I don't want to bog this down, but I was just curious about that. Oh, the diesel fuel costs <clears throat> over the last three years have plummeted. We've also locked in. Um, so I, what does the 8.5 percent mean? When I look at when you look out right now, right now we're budgeted at um, 183, 173 a gallon. I've got it here. I think it's at 173 a gallon. I'm locked in at about dollar 68. But the market right now, looking at the futures, is more like a dollar 90 to a dollar 93. So depending on where you're at, I'm kind of looking out to the future and saying. You know, when I lock in, it's going to be at a much higher rate. That may force some other things in the industry to force it down, but right now I'm taking this conservative look. A uh, quick question on the DART based on Brad's comments. Mm -hmm. So the, the percentage increase there is the contracted increase in price right. that we're paying to DART, but that's per rider, right? That's per rider. So does it make sense from a planning perspective then to have a an adjustment for an expected increase in oh, rent. Oh, absolutely. It does, yeah. Of course, absolutely. conversely, then, do you have a expected potential decrease, right? So fare box revenue was kept at zero, meaning okay. along the same analogy, it means we're not increasing our fare box at all, but we actually, if we're having, if we're expecting a decline in ridership, which I know our, our, our metrics and our goals show that there's a decline in ridership, um, would it then make sense to then show a decline there? Perhaps, yes, we got to take a look at that. That. And overall, my goal here is we have to have a balanced budget. Yeah, you know, so something. But also, the, yeah, at the same right. time, the assumption should match what we realistically think will yes, happen. Exactly. Um, Absolutely. And then balance from that, not yeah. balance first and then squeeze the assumptions in, no, we gotta, <laughs> into making that work. No, then that's exactly what we'll do because we'll take a look and say ridership is way up this year on DART, and that becomes our new base. Add the new contract values in. And see where we're at, and then as we do this weight loss program, it'll be on the budget and on our waistline to value it in. And that's true too. The, the the ridership that we're seeing moving like now will be baked into the base, so we'll we'll uh, we'll know we're going to pay for that. But it's true. Just but look our, out into the future. But if we're looking out now, we're, we're you know, <coughs> if it increases at fourteen percent per year, and we're budgeting, yes. it's just so we can get back into the pension conversation, right? If our expected rate of return is significantly higher than our actual rate of return, we're going to wind up with a, a growing liability, correct? And, and or a growing negative to the to the operation. So, you know, I realize, and that's the great thing about you know compounding in anything. It's, it does grow off the prior number, but we are talking about a five-year plan, not just next year's number. Correct. Okay. Yeah, and my goal on the five-year plan is to work us on the operating side to be as close to neutral, budget mm -hmm. neutral as possible, so that we're not dipping into those reserves. Um, on the supply side, we're basically saying, you know, Henry is working actually on a five-year plan, a very much exacted five-year plan. And right now, I spoke with him. I said, all I'm going to do is take what you're doing today, because we've got it, I think, pretty well steady, and just increase it by the CPI. Are there any questions? We may ask them all. Go ahead. Oh. Um, last question. You said sure, you, yes. you just said you uh, increase it by the CPI. Which CPI are we using? Uh, well, that was it. The 2.6 for the, actually it was for services and supplies. Okay, so it's actually for that. We, we, yes. we narrowed it down for that actual Yes, subject. we got down okay. to that level of detail. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Okay. Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
just to make sure that I know what I heard and in case I get a question at the Fulbright Canales meeting this afternoon, the current ad valorem increases are currently above our previous percentage increases. Yes. Over the next five years, we will get a $5.4 million increase, even with the discount for the homestead expansion. That's my rough estimate taking where we had the five year last year. I don't know if you should say that though, because 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 of the increase, the the uh, loss of the homestead is going to be even greater than the 1.9. Oh, because because everybody's went up. Well, I mean, but it's just kind of conceptual. Plus, I would say I would caution about saying it's PSPAs. None of these things that she oh on the property tax. Okay. These are Pinellas counties. Right. We we just copy what Pinellas County. They do this assumption, and it's they do. Their, Analysis with the appraiser and everything. We just copy what they say. Yeah, but this is this good news. But it is yeah. good news, and you don't know how long that will hold steady. Right. I mean, they've they've decreased mm -hmm. their percent increases out over the next five years. Um, the the county is projecting good news. Yeah, the good, good news compared to what we thought. A year well, ago. I, well I, when I look at construction and home values, it sort of looks like it's going to be another at least one year. We don't know what's going to happen yeah. beyond that one year. And I know we're exceeding our expectations for the number of people who are migrating down to our area. Correct? Well, yeah, the population is growing faster than we expected. Yeah, unless Which will unless we build a wall and make Georgia pay for it. <laughs> yeah, that never gets old. Sure. <laughs> yes, sir. It would seem from a planning purpose, as we're because we're, it's coming from us then to to the full board, mm -hmm. and I pre, and I appreciate his position right now because he's going to go, go to the MPO. Um, really, what we have said previously is that um, that we have planned for the fact that it, we are. This is what you have said. We have planned for the fact that we may end up getting from the CRC, the CRC or this, this thing may get voted in. If it gets voted in, we're planning as though it gets voted in. Right. And we're right. planning accordingly. If it, if it, and so therefore then we got to cover. If it doesn't happen, well, that's a whole other scenario. We really haven't discussed that or what that might do for us. We haven't here certainly in the big, and the board hasn't. So I, I kind of agree with the, com the comment about, you know, Maybe we need to be just a little careful because we really don't know and we really don't know what's going to happen with property values again. Right. And in the five-year plan last year, as it stood, we were balanced for the next four years. Correct. So that was good news with that in there. Yes. You know, but then we, we weren't in the following year. So there's a lot of things that, you know, we'll be looking at to make it a, as best we can a fully five-year balanced plan. That's always our goal, like I said. From an operating standpoint, if you can control the operations, capital can be moved one way or the other. So, always challenges, but it's fun. And all I was going to say was, welcome to the planning department. Even though right. we all think of the budget as a financial thing, right. it's a plan. It's a financial mm -hmm. plan. So the planning department is the one that makes the recommendation to the PSTA board and kind of goes through this over the monthly schedule that Debbie showed at the beginning looking at the different assumptions that we put in there. And when we show negatives, like last year in our out year, which was at that time 2022, uh, this year it's 2023, we had a, we weren't balanced. We had gone through our reserves, we had a negative. And you know, I, I don't worry about these things because we're never going to let that happen, number one, but it's also a good planning tool to go out to, whether it's the MPO, to say, get us on the list for more money. Get us on the list for some of that uh, transit money. Those are the things that we all do because if we say we're that rosy, we'll never get anything from anyone. And I love other people's money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> love it. That way I can keep my little piggy bank for the rainy day. Mm -hmm. All right. Any other questions? Thank you, Debbie. Appreciate okay. it. Okay. Um, future subjects. 
Do we have anything on schedule in there? I don't see anything in the decision. Uh, we're going to, we'll, we'll be starting to present, we're getting into the budget season, so we'll be starting to present pretty much every month the planning committee is some, some aspect of the budget planning. With the full full budget being presented to the committee in June. And Sorry. That means we're on, we're on time. Mr. Mr. Chair? One yes, sir. Just to help you flow through your time. Yes. Um, I want to mention that I went to the TMA meeting last Friday over at the airport. Before that session, I had a chance to talk to one of the senior uh, FDOT people basically about the question that I've been asking for quite a while which is why doesn't the region, regional transit feasibility plan focus in on the need that they, would, they are projecting and I mentioned that uh, in 2004 DOT produced a video that was uh, called the Interstate of Transit video. And uh, the person that I talked to was well aware of that. And I said, well, why didn't, and that particular thing included some comments from the, the private sector about the cost of congestion going forward and some more projections about going forward. But the DOT person said, well, right now, we really cannot advocate for increased revenue from the public. What they can do is they can look at all these 55 studies that were done over the last 30 years and they can update them and they can present an option, what is the most cost effective option that meets the federal transit standards for funding standards. That's what they have presented and we've seen that and we're continuing to see that. What, what he said was, and it's really up to the elected officials and the business community to present that story about the compelling need for future for even, even for the rubber tired solution because we have to come up with a local funding source. I don't see any organized effort by either the elected officials or the private sector in putting together that compelling story. And so I think at some time, and it's gotta be fair this year because DOT is getting ready to turn the switch and start spending that $5 million for the next phase of the study. But they're not going to do that unless we have the local funding match. Now I know that the MPOs are beginning to talk to the county administrative staff, we hear this at Fort Worth and Ellis, about potential sources for that local source. But I would suggest that TSDA leadership needs to kind of think about how do we create that organizationally, how do we build that compelling projection of the future? Because it, it's not going to get done unless somebody takes some leadership on it. So that's, that's my comment. Okay. That's your pitch. Mr. Chairperson? Oh. All right, yes, sir. I, I really like that comment because one of the things that, that I know I'm going to be talking about, I believe, unless it gets touched on at, 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 the, uh, uh, at our Fort Worth and Ellis RMPO is that very subject because really what we're now doing, the feasibility study, is just, to, just finding the least or the most acceptable to the federal funding. Yet we still have this growing need nobody's really talking about this and, and they did they did comment about that and and as I see it um, here we had we had a route 444 that was way <coughs> up there in the I've forgotten the number now $58 uh, cost per ridership um, and yet we 
we continue to hear people saying we can't get someplace or we need more transportation and we kind of look at them and say well we're at our set point you know we're at our point seven five so who who is who's really presenting this rather than rather than someone that comes in and stands up in front of us and says oh we need more buses and we all look at them and we say well you know yeah okay well we know that so if we know that maybe we need maybe maybe from the planning side we need to start really again coming back to that as an issue um, of, of what 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 do we really think we need here? Um, and I know, I know you guys do that all the time, you know. But maybe we need to do that. And maybe maybe the um, the board, the, the, the folks that are that are attempting to to provide board activity for for the agency, really need to get more involved in that. And I think that's your point. Is, is it is it not? Somebody. Or one of the points you're Somebody's going to have to do this. It could be the private sector, but I don't see them doing it. I think it's probably the elected officials together with the private sector to project out what the future is. I don't know. When I've been driving around the last couple of weeks, it's heck on the roads. It and yes. it's even on roads that normally aren't <coughs> congested. Yep. Um, now, yeah, this is spring break. This is the peak. But as long as people keep moving to this area, we're going to lose some of the edge off of our shining city on the hill. And if you go to Orlando or even North Tampa, there's no shining city on the hill over there. It's just, it's just, it's just and it's a common, I think it's a combination of land use, putting things in really the right places on uh, like putting your senior center on a bus route um, and it's also the what are the providing the options other than just that single family or that single riders driver car to get in places all right well thank you everybody and uh, do we have any other business at this point? You want to talk about any other future things? Are we okay? I think Mr. Jordan has the last word on his last <laughs> meeting. Last committee meeting. Yeah, thank you. Bill, we're going to miss you, my no. friend. Well, I'm going to be here for the board meeting next yeah. week. Yep. Um, depending on how quick the, the, the election did occur yesterday. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Albritton is the new council member replacing me. He mentioned he was on before, right? No, Albritton has never no. has never been on. Okay. He actually ran against me four years ago, and I squeaked by and beat him. Mm. But um, during the campaign, he did mention that he was interested in transportation issues. So mm -hmm. he may be maybe he may be a logical person from your city. city. So I would, well, he would be the city's appointment to That's what I'm right. Yes. Yeah. Yes. 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 Okay, cool. <coughs> All right, Josh, thank you very much, sir. Good to see you. Uh, okay, we're going to back to the finance. Those are.